Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced from alexmercedcoder.com. There I am. And um, basically what we're talking about today is Docker. So I've done videos on Docker before, but I thought I'd create like a more like holistic little mini course, especially one um, here in 2022 uh, to update things. But first, let's talk, in this first video I want to do is just talk about Docker, setting up Docker, and being like a Docker consumer. Okay, um, but bottom line, what Docker does for us, it just allows us to kind of set up what's what are called containers and the simplest way to think about it is think of them as like virtual computers they're not the same as a virtual machine so if you ever use something like VirtualBox, where you create like a little virtual computer the difference is that when you use like a virtual machine you are literally it's not just like the file system it's also like the kernel the kernel now if you're not familiar with what a kernel is it's sort of like the core of the operating system that tells like how the computer should interact with the hardware um so basically it's really like the full thing and you're virtualizing it okay which is a lot more resource intensive it takes a lot more resources to run a virtual machine although there are situations where a virtual machine may be a a, a good option um a image is essentially a snapshot of essentially a file system and the programs on it but you're not necessarily reproducing like the underlying like kernel like basically the layers of what you're virtualizing are less but you still get the isolation meaning like when you're inside this container which is like basically a a virtual the mini sort of virtual computer that's based on the image so the image is the picture and we say hey take this picture and make it a real thing that i can interact with and that's the container the container is like this isolated place with its own files it's kind of like its own little computer that you can interact with and whatnot. The beauty of Docker is that we can sit there and spin up many images and containers to replicate an environment. Okay, so for example, if I create an app and the app works really well on my computer, but I want other people to run it on other computers, but well, there's always the issues like what operating system are they running? What versions of different software do they have? There's all these things that are kind of outside of your control with every other computer you run your program on that could cause the program to not run correctly. So by using Docker images to create containers, we can replicate the context in which you wrote the program in. So that way, when someone else runs it on their computer, it's not running in the context of their computer. It's running inside the context of the container, which matches the environment that you want that program running in, um, allowing things to be much more portable. Because now all you have to do is really install Docker, run the container, and then you can run whatever program on as many computers as you want. So it makes it easier to replicate a program across several machines because, again, you don't have to do this whole setup of the computer every time. You just run a Docker container. But again, just to kind of clarify the terminology, the images are the snapshots or like pictures that we can generate or start up a container from. The container is like sort of that virtual computer. Um, now, if you're just using it for personal use, um, you know, or, you know, very small business use, it's gen uh, Docker's gonna be free as we get to like larger levels. Like, let me see what the deal is here. So again, personal is just free. You can, you know, use this to learn and do all sorts of fun stuff. But as you start getting into like heavier usages, usages within the context of a company, then you, you, you end up having like the, the pay. Okay, but right now, if you're watching this video, it's because you want to learn Docker, you're good with like zero, you know, free. So what you want to do is download and install Docker. Now, if you're on Windows or Mac, Docker will install and you'll also get like Docker Desktop, which is like this visual tool that you can use to interact with Docker, which is actually pretty cool. I'm on Linux. Linux, basically, you use Docker purely through the command line, which is aka the terminal, although that'll be universal between all three. So you can use the terminal between Mac, Linux, and Windows. So I always like learning the the command line way of doing things because even on a server computer where you there is no graphical user interface i can always rely on the command line to get things done but once you have docker installed you should be able to type in docker dash dash version in your command line okay and i'm using since i'm using linux i'm technically using the bash terminal if you're on mac you're probably going to be using zush which is fine if you're on windows you're going to be using um either PowerShell or command uh, command prompt. This should be fine for Docker purposes. The, the Docker command should be the same. Um, and I'm not gonna be really using any like bash specific commands, I don't think. So in that case, I think you should be fine. 
Um, but if you really wanted to have like a bash environment on Windows, which I encourage, uh, you can download Git Bash or use Windows Subsystem for Linux to create like basically a, a virtual Linux computer on your machine. Okay, but yeah, so see, I have this Docker version. Okay, great. Now let's just talk about some of these Docker commands. Okay, now what happens is that you may have several images that you download. Okay, so if I want to look at the images that I have, so Docker image, I think it's like the Docker image PS. Yep, uh, nope, Docker image LS. Docker image LS. And what this does is list all the different images that I've downloaded that I have currently on my computer. Okay, so you see the different like image names. Um, when's the last time I've like updated or created this image and like the size. And again, these images can be fairly large because they're fake computers in the sense. So you see like some of these are like three, four gigabytes. So do keep in mind like don't start hoarding images just because you want to hoard a bunch of images because what you can do is you can head over to hub dot docker dot com and you can find this whole sort of like marketplace of images that are free that you know instead of you having to create your own images to figure out how to use like let's say a python image or whatnot you know you can just type over here and search and be like hey python and see like there's an official image okay and the beauty of this is like let's say you don't have python installed in your computer what i could do is i could sit there and say hey i want to run this image so i can be like docker pull i'm just gonna allow me to pull this image from the, the hub store um docker pull python okay and now that's gonna go pull the image okay do, 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 do. and that's gonna take a second because it might be a few gigs and whatnot as you can see generally they are gonna be at least like a gig in size okay and as you can see like it says like none 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 these are all different like versions of or snaps of snapshots of that sub container um so again every once in a while you want to clean this out there's ways of cleaning that out uh, we'll discuss that a little bit later on but first let's actually like use a container so let's use this python container okay and then the cool thing is when you look at these you can generally find a whole bunch of information like how they use it and different versions of it because like maybe i don't want this specific i want a specific version of python i can click over here to tags scroll down and I can find like all the different like versions that I may want to download. So like maybe I want to use like Python 3.8. Okay, so then I, this would be the Docker pull tag I'd use and then I would just pull that specific version. Okay, which gives you a lot of flexibility to sit there and like look through and like find the things that you need. Okay, so now that I have that and you go here, you can read the documentation for it. Okay, so generally every major container or image is going to have a lot of documentation so that way you can figure out how to use it how this container was designed okay i mean this generally one should just be um a basic it's just going to basically be a computer with python installed okay and generally when you want to run a container you just type in docker run because i want to run a container and then the dash it stands i want to open it up in interactive mode so this way i can interact with the container and like send it commands and things okay um, I'm not going to run a particular script, so I'm not going to copy that command. But I can just say docker run it because I want to open it up in interactive mode, and then I'm going to say Python because that's that's the container that I, that's that's the image I want to run. Okay, what's called Python. So if I do this, okay, and see it ran the Python container, which automatically opens me up inside the Python REPL. Okay, I'm inside this container, and I can type start typing in Python code. So if you didn't have Python installed, this is a great way to just go play around with Python. Um, now I can do stuff like print hello world. And see, I'm inside Python. I can like exit the Python shell. So let's see here. Okay, now I'm back out. But the container I think is still running. So if I do docker container, actually I should just be able to do docker ps. Um, and this will show me any running Docker container. So that container is not running. So when I exited, it actually shut off the container, but the container still exists. So if I type in Docker container PS, okay, that's gonna, I think I have to put the all flag, all. So there it shows me all the off containers. So these are all containers that I have that are currently shut off. Okay, I, I've ran them, 
but right now they're they're shut off. So see, there's the Python container that I had ran before. So this hash here, okay, the container ID, I think I can use that to, to run it again. So I can be like docker run. Let's just try that out. Oh, that didn't quite give me the result I wanted. Let me just try to copy that again. Okay. Well, I think I'm trying to run an image. I think it's docker start. I want to start a, a container. Yep, there we go. So now if I do docker ps, see, I see that that container is, that, that container is currently running. And so instead of running a whole new Python container, I'm just using the container that I've already started and I can keep kind of going in and out of it when I want. Okay. Now, right now I'd like to run a command against it. So that should be like docker run Python. So I'm saying, hey, I want to run a command against this. And I think I should be able to just do like slash bin slash bash. Let me just test that out first. No, I don't think that's the right command I want to use. Uh, do, 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 do. Bin, slash bash. You know, I think that's right. Okay, so actually, so let's say, okay, now I have this container running, but how do I access it? So like, that's the question here. Like, okay, hey, I have this container running, but there's something I can really do with it at the moment. I'd like to kind of go into it so I can play with it. What you do is you actually do docker exec. Now, if I just want to execute one command, I would just do docker exec, the name of the, the, name of the container, and then the command that I want to run. So let's just try something like a one-time command. I'll just say echo hello world. So that'd be like the bash equivalent of hello world. Okay. Oh, I need to use the hash. Copy. Docker exec. Echo. Hello world. And see, it works. It basically what it does. So instead of me doing it through my bash terminal on my computer, I'm doing it through the bash inside the container. So I can send any command you can think of to the container using this exec command. I just have to include the hash. And you can give the container a name. Like you can give the container like an actual name so that way you don't have to type this out every time. So you would just use this flag here, like name app. So if I when I create the container, I would have included this name flag and called it my Python. So that way, again, I'm not having to copy and paste this every single time. But let's say I want to go into bash. Again, I'm gonna use the dash IT flag because I want to be in interactive mode. And I'm gonna say, hey, I wanna use bash. Generally Almost all of these containers are going to generally be based on Linux. Okay, and Linux, again, is going to have the bash terminal. So you should be able to access bash because bash is generally going to be inside this binary folder. So this is like the root folder of the Linux of the Linux computer. And then in there, there's a folder called bin, which stands for binaries. And generally, that's where all the programs exist in there. And this is going to be the same thing generally for Mac as well. Um, and uh, there, it's going to be the bash program. So I would just say, hey, run bash and that's going to open up the bash terminal in that environment okay so failed container next and container process called exec not found in path hmm. i guess the python one doesn't have bash let's see here okay uh, must be the particular container um probably should have you know tried the container out first but you guys get the idea um, but cool, you can read the documentation on the container. I have this Python container, so now I want to stop it. So I'll just do docker stop control C. And then I will paste it. And then that'll stop the container. And then again, having giving it a name would make this a lot easier because I could just use the name. Okay, and that's going to take a second and should stop it. Do, 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 do. There it goes, and, it's, and it'll give you back the name so to confirm that you stopped it. So now if I do docker ps again, I can see there's no running containers. Okay, now I see again, if I go to docker container ps all, I can see I do have a lot of shut off containers. Maybe I really just don't want all these containers currently like running. Okay, just maybe I just 
because they're taking up their own individual space. Okay, so may I want to do something like this, Docker, container, um, I think it's container prune. And see, this will remove all, it's giving me a warning saying, hey, all these stopped containers, they're all going to get cleaned out. Okay, none of these have any kind of information that I'm saving. But again, basically that container will continue maintaining its state as you start and stop it. So if you saved files in it, it'll kind of, you can start and stop it and it'll maintain that. But the minute you clean it out and reopen it, it's going to be a fresh container. So um, there are ways to do, to if you want to save files permanently outside of the container, then you use what's called a volume. And with a volume, what you do is you say, hey, I want to open up this container. I want to create a container from this image, but I want this folder to be mapped to this folder in the container. So anytime you do anything in that folder, it's actually editing files in your actual like main computer file system. Um, but that's a lesson for another day. So now I do this, it's going to clean out, see it cleaned out all those containers and see it tells you how much space you saved. Okay. And it says container ps all. So now if I do this and see there's no shut off container. So that's how I would use a container. And you can find lots of these and you can have multiple of them running. So you, again, maybe you want a Postgres database, but you don't have to go install Postgres. You can go run the container. Um, literally anything you can think of. So again, uh, like I'll sometimes use the, the Neo4j database. <clears throat> And I'll just use this image and then I can use it to work with like apps that want to use a graph database on my computer. So that's the gist of just getting started, like how you can ins install Docker and start working with it to use existing images and containers. In the next video, we'll start talking about how you can create your own containers using Docker files. Okay, so I'll see you or create your own images. Again, you use a Docker file to create an image and then the image is used to create a container. So again, the to understand sort of the, the chain of causation. But my name is Alex Rousset from AlexRousset.com. Have a great day and enjoy.